Hello, and welcome to the Real Health Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Holly Jean, and today I am joined with Dr. Peter McCullough. Hello, Dr. Peter McCullough. How are you? Good morning. Thanks for having me. Yes, I'm so glad to have you on. So I don't think I need to do too much of an introduction for you because my audience mostly is familiar with you, but you're a practicing cardiologist. Um, You have over 30 years of medical experience and you're a clinical scholar. You're a frequent news contributor and you are the leading expert on cardiovascular medicine. You've been outspoken, just sounding the alarm bells about heart-related risks that you believe might be contributed to mRNA technology. Um, why don't we talk about that? Let's, I want to, I want to just dive right in. So please fill in any gaps that you might want to share from your um, bio, but let's just, let's dive right into what we're talking about today. Yeah, sure. Well, thanks for having me. <clears throat> I practice yeah, thank both you. In internal medicine and cardiology in Dallas, Texas. And, you know, like all internist and cardiologist, I couldn't help but notice that the SARS-CoV-2 infection uh, was causing problems in the cardiovascular system. We saw that, uh, you know, the initial reports were that uh, blood was clotting. Some patients got so sick, they went on dialysis in a in really unusual fashion. The blood was clotting in the lines, the tubes that were carrying blood to and from the dialysis machine. And we are hearing this from nephrologists. Uh, I'll never forget very early in 2020, the National Institute of, of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Disease, NIDDK, held uh, a, um, an, an ad hoc call. And there were literally hundreds, if not thousands of people on the call. And we were trying to figure out what was going on in the hospital <clears throat> with, respect to, um, with respect to blood clotting. And then even the very first patient we had at our center, we ended up publishing. We published these cases. Uh, he had flown from uh, New York to Dallas. Uh, it was at the time where the pandemic was just hitting New York. He got sick in, in Dallas, came to our hospital. And when he was admitted to the hospital, he went through a precipitous decline. In fact, he died of, of, of a cardiovascular, cardiogenic shock. And it was before there was really significant hypoxemia. So it's, it led us to believe <clears throat> that in fact, the virus could precipitate cardiovascular collapse. And we published another case of a woman, 56 year old <clears throat> a woman who <clears throat> who um, was in, in the ICU, very sick, uh, on the mechanical ventilator. And then we noticed her QT interval prolonging on the EKG. And then she went into an arrhythmia called torsade de point and then had a ventricular tachycardia arrest. And, and the interesting thing is, you know, she didn't take any drugs that could prolong the QT. People uh, we're pointing at hydroxychloroquine at the time. She didn't receive, receive any hydroxychloroquine. We realized that it was the lead cytokine in the illness, interleukin-6, which tr can trigger uh, arrhythmias. So to summarize, we knew that the virus uh, uh, could cause blood clotting. It, it itself could trigger arrhythmias. And then I think that ultimately what came out of this was a concern that the virus itself could cause heart damage or myocarditis. And so this launched... Uh, an entire series of investigations. And uh, because in the hospital, a blood test called cardiac troponin is elevated, is commonly elevated in sick ICU patients, probably more than half the time. And sure enough, it's elevated in those who have COVID-19, but that's not myocarditis. Myocarditis is a clinical syndrome of chest pain, EKG changes, uh, reductions in heart pumping function, and then ultimately sudden death or heart failure. <clears throat> that wasn't happening uh, in that type of uh, scenario in the hospital, we could tell. So the, uh, the NCAA Big Ten uh, in 2020 initiated a, a league-wide campaign to identify myocarditis. So at about 20, I think it was 30% of the athletes in 2020 got COVID-19. So it tells you people are pretty much, you know, getting through it, but right. they did cardiac troponin, EKG, uh, and then MRI <clears throat> on thousands and thousands of athletes. And I believe they found a total of six elevated cardiac troponin tests, six above the upper limit and normal. And the high sensitivity troponin tests uh, we know can be elevated just, uh, you know, as part, even in the general population. And then there was about 37 abnormal MRIs that uh, I believe they had, had adjudicated um, somewhere between two and four cases of clinical myocarditis, no hospitalizations, no deaths. So the NCA dropped it. The conclusion was 
COVID-19 respiratory illness doesn't cause myocarditis. What we then saw was a, a report from the VA by uh, Xi and colleagues, and now a recent uh, uh, paper <clears throat> that has uh, uh, been reviewed. It was uh, published back in 2020, um, but it was regarding SARS-CoV-2 and stroke. And the first author is Shazui and colleagues. And this was very early in 2020. So this was in the uh, in in the months uh, before August of 2020. So it, it's from the very start of the pandemic. These were sick hospitalized patients, but they reported on stroke and, and two types, atherosclerotic th uh, a stroke, and then actually uh, thrombotic stroke or blood clots. And uh, th the main conclusion here is that just like blood clots in the dialysis lines, that uh, in fact, the virus itself could cause stroke. And what caught my eye in that paper is that the inpatient mortality was 25%. So uh, I, I can tell you that it became common practice and it's been my practice. By the way, it's been in the McCullough protocol. I've published the most, uh, the first and most widely used treatment protocol for COVID-19. Mm -hmm. We've always covered blood clotting, either right. with aspirin, full dose aspirin, 325 milligrams, and then in higher risk patients, use of anticoagulants like anoxaparin or low molecular weight heparin or oral anticoagulants like apixaban or rivaroxaban. And We've never neglected this because it's, it typically happens in the bed bound nursing home patients and very elderly patients. That's, that's what's with COVID-19. Now, fortunately, the virus is mutated to much more milder forms. It's far less invasive. And with the Omicron variant, it's, it's only been a handful of patients I've had to fully anticoagulate. But we do recommend aspirin for everybody. Uh, cardiovascular events, stroke. Uh, and blood clotting uh, and arrhythmias are real with acute inpatient COVID, but myocarditis or heart inflammation can happen, uh, but, but it's rare. Okay, so we're starting to see commercials and reports talking about myocarditis and heart health and stuff, especially like for children and stuff. So is this something we can expect to be seen as something being normalized? Well, we're in 2022 and what's really happened uh, since very early in December of 2020 has been the release of the COVID-19 vaccines. So uh, unlike the respiratory illness, which stays in the sinuses now with the Omicron variant, as I mentioned, it really doesn't invade the body. Uh, we really don't have blood clotting or stroke uh, as, uh, as a frequent problem because people aren't in the hospital. I haven't had a patient. I've had one patient in the hospital, I think over nine months now with Omicron. But the vaccine gives a heavy dose of the spike protein. That's the part of the virus that promotes blood clotting. The vaccine gives a heavy dose of the spike protein to everybody who takes the vaccine. And we know that because the antibody rise against the spike protein is far greater than those who take the vaccine compared to those who had the respiratory infection. So we'd infer there's a lot more exposure to the spike protein. The spike protein in hundreds of papers now in the peer review literature is proven to be the component of the infection that causes blood clotting. And unfortunately, the vaccine didn't pick another part of the virus to feature. It features the spike protein. And so okay. what we know now is um, <clears throat> the spike protein uh, itself in high doses can not only cause blood clotting, but it can cause heart damage. And there were papers earlier on, one by uh, Avolio and colleagues, suggesting that the pericytes, the structural cells were damaged by the spike protein. And then the Germans paper by Bohmeyer and colleagues, they physically found the spike protein in the heart in young people who develop myocarditis. So the question was, how often does this happen? Well, <clears throat> the CDC's initial, uh, in a sense, estimate was 62 cases per million. As a background before the vaccines, the rates of myocarditis in young people, it can happen after a parviral virus or adenovirus infections, was about four cases per million. So the vaccines <clears throat> put it on a whole different level. It's 62 cases per million. Uh, and then a paper by um, Tracy Hogan colleagues from UC Davis, uh, they estimated that it was several hundred per million. And then Scharf and colleagues from Kaiser estimated 530, uh, 532 cases uh, per million. Uh, and then the bombshell report was by Manugian and colleagues, and this came from ba Bangkok, Thailand. It's the first prospective cohort study, meaning they measured 
the cardiac troponin, the blood test for myocarditis, EKG and echo in young people age 13 to 18 before the vaccine, the second shot of Pfizer. <clears throat> and then they measured all the same tests after the vaccine. And the uh, stunning result is that 2.5% of the kids were getting heart damage, about half of it they didn't even feel. They didn't even feel. And in that study, it was a small study, two kids were hospitalized with oh, myocarditis. My. So that now it's putting it at 25,000 cases per million, 25,000 kids, and about half are not feeling it. So what are the implications? If a, if a young person gets myocarditis, now 90% are men, and it's a peak age is 18 to 24. If they have myocarditis and they don't feel it, they sustain heart damage. The heart damage makes a scar, and then the scar becomes the nidus for which the abnormal heart rhythm starts. And it starts with ventricular tachycardia and then rapidly progresses to ventricular fibrillation and sudden death. Uh, and this explains, we believe, uh, the, the burgeoning numbers of deaths in young people that we're seeing all over the world. It's, it's not the virus, it's actually the vaccine. The vaccine causes myocarditis now proven in the literature uh, in yeah. large numbers of young people. And uh, you know, I just testified for a Canadian uh, group last night and I said that, uh, that every death that occurs in a, in a younger person that is, is unexplained is due to the vaccine until proven otherwise. And so if the family comes forward and said, hey, they never took the vaccine, fine, we rule that out. Or if an autopsy is done and it shows they died of, of some other condition, a cancer that we didn't know about, okay, the rule's not. But otherwise, all of these deaths, these athletes, <clears throat> these public uh, um, figures, uh, I mean, one of the saddest deaths we saw was the death of uh, Democratic Congressman Sean Caston in Illinois, who was a strong promoter of vaccines. He said he took the vaccines. He's going to push his family to take the vaccines. And now recently, actually this week in The Hill, uh, the Washington uh, Journal, uh, he uh, concedes that, in fact, his daughter had taken the vaccine. She was perfectly healthy, had no medical problems whatsoever, and was found dead in her bed at home. He was told she died of a cardiac arrhythmia. I agree. She died of the cardiac arrhythmia because she had subclinical myocarditis. That's the only smoking gun is she took the vaccine. I tell you, we don't have 17-year-old perfectly healthy girls dying in their sleep all over the right. country. I mean, it just doesn't happen. Um, you know, in, in a paper by Gill and colleagues, <clears throat> two boys in Connecticut uh, in their teenage years were found dead at home by their parents on days three and four after Pfizer. And the parents were outraged. They got autopsies and they concluded that the kids died of vaccine-induced myocarditis. So it's in the it's peer review. Heartbreaking. It's, it's happening to people. I want everybody listening to this to understand that, that, that a manifest, the first manifestation of a side effect of the vaccine can be death. It's so hard for people to, to, to come to grips with that. Right, right. And you and you talk about this. This is what you share about on online, on social media. You're constantly posting this information, scientific abstracts, manuscripts. Um, you've recently been banned on a social media platform. And I want to talk about that post that got you that slap on the wrist in a minute. But um, you've been a highly respected doctor for decades. And now you're called controversial just for sharing what you're finding and what you're seeing. Um have you always been a rebel or is this kind of new territory for you to have to experience this level of criticism? You know, I've never uh, been called controversial or criticized by any doctor of medical standing. This is very important. It's just the media. There's been no chief of medicine, no chief of infectious disease. There's no one who's even expressed disagreement with me. This is very important. Uh, there's nobody publicly at a major institution or the CDC, NIH, or FDA, who's come out and disagreed with me. This is very important. So I assume they agree with me. Uh, where you see any type of criticism, it's uh, from anonymous, uncredentialed fact checkers. We're not sure <clears throat> where these uh, operatives are in social media, but they don't, uh, they're certainly not doctors of significant medical standing. But you're right, uh, after a, a year of perfect tweeting on Twitter and, and you know, I make uh, graphical abstracts of manuscripts. I just simply report the information, uh, put forward uh, important video summaries of the scientific information. Uh, Twitter uh, first, actually this is on October 6th, 
Twitter first actually drained my account of all my followers. It took my account to zero. And I saw this. I took a screenshot of it. Mm -hmm. Then they suspended my account. Uh, and, and, and I wasn't able to download all my data. So all that was lost. And so my tech teams and legal teams appealed to Twitter. Now Twitter is backpedaling and we're uh, negotiating with Twitter on the steps forward. But it's obvious they didn't follow due process. Uh, there's nothing in the community rules saying that Twitter can just eliminate um, uh, users in your account. You know, followers you know, are built yeah. over time. And the other important point is we had previously, I had previously sued Twitter uh, in the last few months over a prior account, a COVID-19 treatments account, which was specifically on treatments for COVID-19. Uh, and they had uh, suspended that account after about 20,000 followers. And um, uh, their Twitter prevailed. It was interesting. I want people to know this. Twitter prevailed. And, and they prevailed based on a motion, uh, what's called SLAP, or Strategic Lawsuit Against Public Participation. Twitter asserted that they have the right to participate in this public scientific conversation on COVID-19. But instead of Twitter executives coming out and giving their own opinions and analyses and you know, standing behind them, Twitter's right that they're exercising is to manipulate our accounts. Twitter right. says they are shaping the conversation by manipulating accounts and they believe they have the right to do so. As a user, I view Twitter as a common carrier. There's no different than any other common carrier of communication. And they certainly could follow Federal Communications Commission rules, um, but they shouldn't have community rules that allow them to manipulate users in their environment. And the reason why Twitter is important is because it's so big. It's the biggest platform. So I have other social media platforms. I'm active on Getter and Truth Social. But on Twitter, I had 512,000 followers. We had actually screenshotted Twitter um, uh, unfollowing my followers. They had done that for quite some time. So we had that in evidence. So things aren't looking too good for Twitter right now. Um, yeah. I've responded by starting the Substack, which uh, gives even a, a better chance of uh, fully uh, outlining the information. And already there's been uh, a, a blizzard of activity. People understand what's going on. What my next question is, you know, is the next reach of censorship going to be in Substack or Truth Social or Getter? Right. Well, I think it's just going to follow. Um, but California, so in California, the Senate recently passed a bill that will allow regulators to punish physicians for spreading what they call misinformation or disinformation related to COVID-19. So, I mean, it's leaving social media and it's now going into legislation, the censorship of what we can say. What do you, what does this mean for doctors or for patients for informed consent in, in the future? I think it's important for your listeners to know, you know, I'm a doctor. I'm the most published doctor in my field in the world in history. I'm one of the most published in COVID-19. There is no such thing as misinformation. It doesn't exist. In, in, in science and medicine, there's, there simply are scientific data and observations. And there's two or more interpretive points of view. There always are. There is no such thing as misinformation. It doesn't exist. So, so how do we pass bills about well, something that some, doesn't exist? For some, for some group to declare that they hold information or they can adjudicate misinformation is false. They simply can't do that. There, there's no truth council here. Uh, we've seen the CDC completely reverse course on issue after issue after issue. They've never held information. They've never been in a position to adjudicate misinformation. So the CDC can't do it. No, no governmental agency can do this. And now we've heard about AB 2098, the California bill. It's called the Dr. Muzzle Law, which is, by the way, been signed into law by Gavin Newsom. So it's law. That's why I moved so, from California. <laughs> I'm in Oklahoma now. <laughs> a doctor cannot talk to patients about COVID-19 without the risks of being declared misinformation. So you can imagine uh, a doctor seeing a patient who took the vaccine and now has heart damage and the doctor is trying to tell the patient that they have heart damage. This is proven in the literature. The patient and the family getting upset and saying, uh, the doctor um, spread misinformation or the patient's family and they reported to the board. Uh, uh, that doctor now has to face a legal challenge for the license. That can cost $100,000, $200,000, $300,000. Basically one can lose their license or be right. bankrupt over this. Uh, what I've heard on the street is in California, doctors are not going to treat COVID. 
They're not going to talk about it. It's not even that they're going to take protective measures. Why wouldn't they? So what that means is the, the Californians with COVID, with long COVID and now vaccine injuries are going to get no care, none. Uh, and so, uh, you know, California AB 2098, there's been another development. I want everybody to understand this happened over the weekend. Do you know PayPal put out new terms of use where yep, they said that they would drain $2,500 out of anybody's account if they spread COVID misinformation. So here, here are the issues. We're three years into this. Why did PayPal executives decide this now? Do they have a medical board? Are they gonna be adjudicating misinformation? How are they gonna figure it out? Do they have profiles on all their users? I mean, obviously on, in PayPal, people are just using you know, a financial transaction. What does that have to do with misinformation? Where did that come from? Uh, and and uh, you know, I am suspicious that government agencies are reaching out to these social media platforms uh, and now financial transaction platforms. Government agencies are prompting this. I, I'm suspicious a government agency prompted PayPal uh, and, and because PayPal is a mechanism by which there could be financial injury. And uh, the, out, the outrage, people started taking their accounts to zero. I know I did. People started canceling their PayPal accounts. There was a yeah, giant, their, in a sense, their um, stock tanked. <laughs> yeah, their stock tanked. There was a run on the PayPal bank. And, they, and then within a day or two, they reversed course. No, 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 we didn't meet it. But I think I want your listeners to, to think about this. If PayPal can do this, what's next? Bank of America? You, you know, Citibank? Comerica? What's next? Right. Uh, yeah, it, it's not too far off to think about the those conspiracies of social credit scores and what they can and can't control for people. Like yeah. that doesn't seem so incredibly abstract anymore. It doesn't. But think think about this immediate penalty, though. I mean, here you and I are talking about scientific data, and I've cited the papers. But a viewer or a federal agency operative could take a look at this video and say, you know what? Holly and Dr. McCullough are spreading misinformation. They could, they could, they could make that allegation. They could send it to a financial institution and say, "Why don't you penalize them?" And they, it looks like they could do that with no due process. What would be the appeal situation? What would be the the court proceedings? I've told you, misinformation doesn't even exist. So. Right. We're in a, a situation where I think everybody, we need deep investigation and in what happened in PayPal, for sure. We need deep investigation in what's happened at Twitter. Now we do know American First Legal did sue Twitter uh, for information. And we learned that Twitter has been meeting with the CDC and Facebook and crafting this government false agenda. So we know that part of the reason why my account was suspended is because Twitter is trying to craft a false agenda. And while I'm giving true and accurate scientific information to the community, they saw me as a target. There's a couple things I want to talk about. I want to talk about one, why we think this is like happening. What's the end game here? But first you mentioned um, in California, how it's going to be harder for patients to find doctors, even treat them. And I want to ask about the wellness company website that you're a part of, because I know that there are options on there for people to be able to find practitioners and doctors to treat them. Is that um, like virtual care? What is that about? I think Californians are going to rush massively to a new solution. I was a part of help bringing forward the wellness company led by Canadian e-commerce juggernaut Foster Colson uh, is put together a nationwide company uh, now initially in the United States. Uh, it's got verticals of healthcare, pharmacies, uh, prescription medications, nutraceuticals, supplements, education, and it's live and it's operational. Uh, Californians are going to be going to twc.health. It's a website. That's all it is. If you type dot, dot com, you won't get there. It's twc.health. And that's the wellness company. Make sure you put that in the program notes and people can sign up. They can get a personal account. Uh, if they got COVID or a vaccine injury, they can get care right away. Uh, and, and they'll get medications, they'll get laboratories, x-rays, all the things needed. It's going to be virtual initially and probably into brick and mortar later on. Employer groups are already signing up. This is very interesting. 
Um, uh, they're going to have a focus on wellness, getting people well, hopefully being able to get some people off uh, this bevy of prescription drugs that have piled up on people over time. It's a very in innovative concept. I'm the chief scientific officer for the company and uh, taking this role on a part-time basis uh, to- In all your free time. <laughs> to help them along. No, it's an important, you know, we, we've, been, we've been making all these complaints and we've been describing all these bad things, but, but this is an answer. This is a uh, this is a response, and it's on unassailable platforms. Uh, you know, we're seeing all kinds of uh, illegal activities going on. Let me give you another one. This one really yeah. happened. Yeah. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was a headline speaker at a program at the Colonial Country Club in Fort Worth. And on the same day, I was a headline speaker at a program in Queensland, Australia. I did it virtually. Do you know both programs were ticketed by Eventbrite? The night before the events, Eventbrite notified everybody the events were canceled, which they weren't, and Eventbrite kept the money. They kept the money. So again, the question is, who at Eventbrite decides to do this? That's clearly illegal. It's not following any due processes. It's misleading everyone. Or is there a government agency that has contacted Event bright and said, listen, Dr. McCullough is out there speaking. We want you to kill this opportunity for him. This is very important. We, we keep seeing this now over and over yeah. again. Let me give you another example. Yeah. Uh, a, a user yesterday through social media uh, told me about uh, uh, an encounter she had. She had COVID and uh, she used a, a nasal spray product that she got over Amazon. You know, and nasal sprays, actually a whole variety of them work in COVID. They reduce the intensity, duration of symptoms and supported by the preclinical science, clinical science. And then on Amazon, she tried to post her review of what happened. It was a favorable review. Amazon contacted her and told her she's violating terms of the community on posting a product review. So, so again, it, this goes back to like, what what is the end game here? Like, what what do you think this whole reason of trying to control this information and keep it hidden from people, what's the point? Like, aren't we supposed to be trying to help people and help people get better? And like never and before in well, medicine, could, have we done this? What's well, going on? You, well, listen, we've, we've given, I've given you examples of what's not permissible. So what's not permissible is pub publishing or presenting scientific data, uh, giving product reviews, live speaking events, none of those appear to be permissible. What is permissible? It looks like wide open, unbridled promotion of mass vaccination is very permissible, very permissible. So if we just went out and said, listen, the vaccines are great, get vaccinated, get vaccinated, that appears to be completely permissible. I'm unaware of anybody getting their account suspended at Twitter because they promoted the vaccines. None. Right. If anybody out there is listening and they've had their account deleted because they've been very promotional on the vaccines, let me know. Um, I think, and it's in my book, Courage to Face COVID-19. If you go to uh, courage to face covid.com, it's in my book. I think from the very beginning, there's been an intentional suppression of any forms of treatment or hope for COVID-19, a complete suppression of early treatment in order to prepare the population to accept mass vaccination. I think this entire sequence of events is to promote mass vaccination. I think the, the, the labeling of COVID misinformation really means anything that doesn't promote the vaccine, anything about COVID that would make somebody want to, you know, uh, consider the risks and the benefits of the vaccine. I think right. that's what, I think that's what's going on. I think this is completely promotional for mass vaccination, which at this point in time is, uh, is, is, is a medical procedure that people have to look at at face value. It's, they are still all under emergency use authorization. Everyone knows they're offered for free uh, they're not bought and sold. The insurance companies don't have to approve it. You know, it's still emergency use authorized. The vaccines are the genetic code that was uh, manipulated in a Chinese biosecurity lab by U.S. Uh, uh, research. 
that codes for the lethal Wuhan spike protein. That's what the vaccines are. Everyone is getting installation of this genetic code. We now know the genetic code does not leave the body. There's no evidence that the body clears it out. The spike protein seems to be installed without, with little evidence that it actually leaves the body. Now, these are permanent injections every six months. And our agencies are telling us they're not safe. The FDA tells us they cause myocarditis and heart damage. We've reviewed that. The FDA right. says they cause blood clots. We've reviewed that, including dangerous strokes, fatal strokes. The FDA says they cause blood disorders, vaccine-induced thrombocytopenic purpurea and blood clotting. And lastly, the FDA says they cause neurologic damage. So you know these vaccines that are being widely promoted, and there's been such an investment in trying to push the vaccines, and then all these nefarious activities in order to quell any information that uh, is, is exposing the vaccines in terms of risks and benefits. This is all done in the open, and there is great public harm being done right now. This appears to be a government and worldwide program to do harm. There's no other conclusion one could arrive at. Right. And the question still remains why. So for people who have had the vaccine or are experiencing things, you've mentioned that the, there's no evidence that the spike proteins leave the body. Do they have hope? Is there Are there any treatments or anything going on to help people recover from maybe the more mild type of symptoms that or adverse reactions that are being reported, like brain fog and just body pain and just not feeling the same? Like what kind of hope do we have to offer people, if any? Well, first off, the, the, the uh, two most important factors to know is that once somebody's already been through COVID, the next case of COVID, uh, they have about 97% plus protection against any serious illness. It's like a common cold. That protection is durable. It lasts over time. The author is Kimatelli and colleagues that published that very large study. The second point is the virus is far milder than it used to be. Uh, and, and so people developing community COVID have relatively little forms of side effects. We've already reviewed that. They, they, t they don't sustain heart damage or, or have these other problems or they're far because it, the syndrome is less invasive. All the horrible things that happened with COVID was on the inpatient side. So people hospitalized with COVID, oh yeah, 50% of them had long COVID. Um, in a paper by Bruce Patterson and colleagues, even those with inpatient COVID, they found spike protein in the body for 15 months afterwards. There was um, a autopsy study by Chertow and colleagues, again, of sick patients with COVID, not the vaccine, but COVID. And uh, th they died with COVID. And, and those who died with COVID weeks or months afterwards, they found the virus in the body alive and replicating. So this is a, a real thing. Uh, the government right now is not investing in randomized trials of large randomized trials of long COVID or vaccine injuries, they're, they're, they're very similar syndromes. So we don't have government research. Right now it's a guess. So people are recommending different vitamins or nutraceuticals or all I can tell you clinically is I try to identify the syndromes. If there's heart damage, if there's blood clotting, I use conventional ways to treat them, uh, but they're difficult to treat. Uh, and, and so uh, without government recognizing what's going on, we're never gonna get to, to research-based solutions. Right now, the government is interested in one thing, a needle in every arm that appears to be the only interest, the only interest. You don't see government advertisements saying, have you had a vaccine injury? We've got a research program for you. None. The government is actually not publicly acknowledging these or analyzing them. They're not giving us any risk stratification. How can we avoid vaccine-induced death? No one knows. Our CDC VAR system which is a gross underreporting that's going on. They've got they've captured 14,000 Americans who've died with the vaccine, reported by doctors and healthcare workers, paramedics, and thousands of them die right there the day they get the vaccine or the next day. The government's giving no guidance on what to do about this. This is stunning. Typically, just with a handful of deaths, these should have been pulled off the market. They should have been pulled. You know, Pfizer's not talking about it under court order. Pfizer released data that they knew about 1,223 deaths within 90 days of their product being used. Pfizer should have pulled it off the market after five deaths. The FDA tried to cover this up for 55 years yep. in, the, in the court action. So, you know, Americans need to know they are not being protected by the US FDA, Pfizer or Moderna. 
the government appears to be relentless on this campaign that's doing great harm and causing deaths to Americans. So you mentioned VAERS. VAERS has been around since I think the 80s, right? The Vaccine Adverse Reporting System. I don't remember exactly what it stands for. Um, and so it's been reporting vaccine injury for decades, um, but it hasn't been until recently we've been seeing this like huge spike in the in the VAERS data. But I remember listening to you back when you were on Joe Rogan, like early in all of this, when you were first starting to ask questions and and raise concerns about the the rush development of the vaccine. And I remember you saying then that you were still supportive of the vaccine program in general. And it was this one vaccine that you were concerned about. Do you still feel confident in the entire vaccine program or has this caused you to maybe kind of question other ones as well? Well, this vaccine debacle and, and the lack of the vaccine manufacturers who do have liability uh, shields and indemnity uh, has made myself and many Americans question what's going on with vaccines overall. If, if this can happen with the COVID vaccine, could other people have been damaged with other vaccines? Or could we have vaccines that simply don't work? You know, we haven't mentioned this, but the COVID-19 vaccines don't work. They don't stop infection. They don't stop transmission. They don't make the syndrome milder. A recent paper by Graspa and colleagues that I pop, that posted on Twitter, is published in JAMA, showed that those fully vaccinated who do end up in the hospital, it's pretty rare, but when they do, the mortality is 62%. I mean, the vaccines have no impact in making the syndrome more mild. Um, it's, 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 and our CDC agrees. Our CDC has said that a vac fully vaccinated person is indistinguishable from an unvaccinated person, our CDC officials. So everybody should understand that, that we shouldn't have these, these, in a sense, false assumptions. Um, I recently ran into uh, somebody in my neighborhood and they, you know, we, we, you know, they wanted to talk about this. And they said, listen, I took the vaccines, I'm well. And, and I mentioned, well, they don't work and they don't. He goes, but he goes, if I get COVID, it's going to be milder. I said, no. I said, COVID's mild as it is. And if you get serious COVID, the, vac the, the rates of, of hospitalization and death are the same. And it was so hard for that person to accept that because there's been just this onslaught of false narratives by the government. Well, we've been told for, I mean, my entire life, I know that I've been hearing if you get the flu shot, it makes it less mild of the flu, you still get the flu. So I think we've just been, it's just been accepted well, that if you let, get it, then it makes it less, you know. Right. Let's talk about these other vaccines. And, you know, unlike other um, media commentators, other doctors, uh, and people that you see on TV, you notice that I'm citing the data. You know, the best doctors actually know the information and they can cite the data. And that way people can look up the papers themselves. To my knowledge, and I watch, you know, other media commentators. I'm a frequent commentator on Fox and Newsmax and Victory Channel. I've been on ABC. No one quotes the data like I do. No one. And so it's, I'm coming up on a year when I went to Joe Rogan's studio and I told Joe Rogan, I'm bringing the data, I'm bringing the slides. I told the Spotify producers. And the reason why my interview set all records for his program, I eclipsed everything in history. There's nothing that has eclipsed me since that time. And I beat Elon Musk. Why was it such a bombshell? Why did the White House comment on my Joe Rogan interview? Because I brought the data. I didn't just make this up. I showed every slide and Rogan's jaw started to drop. Uh, and I told him at the time, yeah, listen, I trust other vaccines. I haven't really uh, evaluated them critically, but I've taken them all and don't have any issues with them. Well, you know, now we learn uh, in MMWR, the CDC Journal 2022, Chung and colleagues published that the flu vax, the flu, flu shot last year had 16% vaccine efficacy which was statistically insignificant from zero, zero. Yep. The CDC is telling us that the flu shot has zero benefit, zero. And the question on the table is who should take a shot of any type that has zero benefit? Because if there is an odd immune reaction or something happens, then it's, it's for no good. So, you know, I can tell you I'm declining the flu shot from this point forward, unless somebody brings compelling evidence that I'm at risk for fatal influenza and that the vaccines really work. Why take the risk? People are going back now 
and looking at how about diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis, DTP. You know, these are all treatable bacterial infections. Do we really need to vaccinate for them? Um, you know, we have uh, other things on the table. The the polio vaccines, uh, oral. I had oral as a child. Now uh, they're back to injectable. Polio was largely, you know, on the way down. I don't think the vaccines had any impact on the polio uh, cases that existed. It was largely, uh, you know, treatment of sewage water and clean water that right. made the. You know, there still is polio, by the way, in any place where they're using the oral polio vaccines, including the the neuropathic strains. There's three strains of polio virus. So, uh, you know, you go anywhere else where they're using, it, it is going to be in the wastewater. Uh, and so in New York recently, they discovered some polio in the wastewater, which it will happen. You get some immigrants from another country. And so New York declared a polio emergency, a polio emergency. And so, you know, you know we have a situation where the vaccines have come in without prospective randomized placebo controlled trials. The vaccines have come in without demonstrating prevention of these clinical outcomes. And they come in with an assumption that they're safe and effective. And I right. think everybody now, since the COVID vaccine debacle, is going to re-examine that. Yeah, I, th I think you're right. I mean, I think anyone with um, common sense. So what do you say to the parents, the mother of the the high school kids who have been working so hard to get into college and to maybe get sports scholarships and they're getting in, but a condition for going to that school or playing the sport that they love and have trained for is, is to get the vaccine. Like that is such a, a, a difficult position to be in, but that is one that a lot of people are finding themselves in. So, I mean, what, what do you say to that parent, to that child, you know? One could view this as a game of Russian roulette. And, you know, a recent Zogby survey showed of people who took the vaccine, 85% are fine. 85% are fine. But 15% have some new disease or something wrong with them. And everybody has to face that 85-15 risk. And 15 is a big number. So, uh, and, and then, you know, there is not in that survey because, you know, it was people who are alive who responded to it. There are these numbers of, of people who die. And we know from the EMA, European Medicine Agency release of information that a large fraction of the vaccine vials, the messenger RNA degrades. It can degrade. They actually had in their, in their data file 78% of rates of, of degrading <laughs> messenger RNA. You can imagine these sitting out at CVS and pharmacy, at CVS and Walgreens. They're not being super cold. Multiple needles in the vials and air being introduced. I think most people are getting a dud. I think most people are getting inactive, and that's the reason why they're surviving. Um, those who get um, a decent dose of viable messenger RNA, I think it's lethal, uh, and, and that's what's happening. You know, Sasha Ladi Pova, former uh, pharmaceutical um, expert regulatory expert published in trial site news that the majority of the injuries and deaths with the COVID vaccine are in restricted lots, restricted lots. So that means the lot is the number on the vaccine card. So there are certain lots that are called hot lots that are probably well manufactured, well cooled, well transported, and people get a sizable dose of viable messenger RNA. That tells you we have a product problem. It's not randomly distributed in the population. There's a product problem. People can actually go look up their lot. It's called hot lots. You go look it up on the internet. So the, the question for the, the student and the parent is, do they go into the vaccine program knowing that 15% chance of being sick or being injured with this, and then, a, then a, some type of statistical risk of dying with this, or, um, uh, or potentially not playing sports or picking a different school? It has to do with one's life and their health. Every parent who t and the student who takes the risk and the student is damaged or, or, or dies, they regret it. They regret it. In fact, I think the regret and shame is so deep, they don't even go public on this. You know, Sean Caston, the congressman I mentioned, he has not, still not come out and said, I regret having my daughter vaccinated. I, I think the regret, the remorse, the shame is so deep they can't even come to grips with this. It's pretty rare that that a parent would have 
uh, the emotional strength to do this. You know, one such parent is Ernesto Ramirez in South Texas. Uh, he's, you know, he's a truck driver, single father, parent. Uh, you know, he was hearing all this messaging about the vaccine. He went out and got it himself to kind of test it. So he thinks it's pretty safe. So then he had a 16 year old, year old son take it. And then his son died on the basketball court of myocarditis a few days later. There's an autopsy. I reviewed it. I'm telling you, he died of myocarditis. Ernesto has gone out and said, I made a mistake. I made the mistake of my life and I no longer have my only son. And he is out warning other people. But but he's rare. The other parents don't seem to have the emotional strength to do that. Recently, uh, there was a nurse. You may have seen this report, uh, a nursing student. She was 20 years old. She had to get vaccinated to go on her clinicals. Uh, she died about two days after taking the vaccine. The mother did come out and you see the press release of her, her and her daughter. There's a picture of her and her daughter standing before the, uh, in front of the ocean saying, you know, what a regret she has. She's lost her daughter due to the COVID-19 vaccine. I think until more parents come out and family members come out and express outrage, this is going to continue and more and more people are going to lose their lives. I would like to believe that, but I've been in this for a while with other things. I've, I've been to the nation's capital for vaccine injury awareness event. I've been to rallies in Sacramento. I've been to all these things. I've seen the, the vaxxed bus and all I've heard so many stories of parents coming out and sharing. And unfortunately my experience has just been to be shamed, to be discredited, to be completely dismissed. And so I think it will take a lot of people really coming out and and being able to be heard. I think now we have the benefit of people being more receptive to the information because we have been seeing things that don't make sense. We have been physically and visibly seeing more reactions. And so I do think we have that. When do you think we will be at a point, if ever, where we'll look back at this time in history and collectively realize, oh, we've made a mistake. You know, we're not hearing any, we've gone through two presidents right now, uh, two White House task force, CDC, NIH, FDA. Now, um, uh, our CDC director, uh, Walensky, says we've made large mistakes and we need to own up to them. Now, people have asked what mistakes did they make? Uh, and, and, you know, that hasn't been elucidated. But one obvious mistake is for the CDC to be administering a vaccine program. That's not what they do. The CDC should have nothing to do with the COVID-19 vaccines. They're emergency use authorized. Uh, these products should be specifically between the doctors and the patients. No government agency should be involved with this. The CDC does outbreak analysis, uh, in, in vitro diagnostics and data analytics. They, they were way outside their scope. The FDA should not be administering a vaccine program. The FDA should be a safety watchdog. They are way outside their scope. So we have agencies that are uh, you know, out of their league uh, uh, and, uh, and people are being damaged by this. And what we know is our CDC is telling us 82% of Americans took at least one shot, uh, that two thirds got fully vaccinated. They took two shots, okay. Of those two thirds, we heard a third went and took one of the old boosters. And now we hear with the new boosters of those eligible, remember those eligible now is a pretty small fraction of Americans that the uptake of the new bivalent boosters, which were not tested on humans and, and didn't work in animals either, uh, that those are the uptake of those is under 5%. So you have a small sliver of people in America who uh, are continuing on with this, thankfully, thankfully. Uh, we have countries that were the most hyper vaccinating like Israel, drop it completely. We've had the UK drop it completely. Other countries come out like Denmark and say no vaccination for young people, okay? We've now had the state of Florida say no vaccination for young people. Uh, and so it's, it's, you know, you see this fracturing. Um, I, I think we will see a, a day of reckoning within our lifetime. Uh, I am stunned though, as an expert doctor, a practicing doctor, that we're three years into this and we're still having these discussions. Yeah, and I can tell you, if I was running the FDA or if I was the CEO of Pfizer, if 
Pfizer would have been off the market before February 1st to examine what went wrong and Moderna and J&J would never have come out. Yeah. Well, Dr. McCullough, I, I want to be respectful of your time. I thank you so much for coming on today. Um, for our listeners, again, it's twc.health for the wellness company. It's courage to face covid.com to pick up uh, Dr. McCullough's book and find him on social media while you can. Um, Dr. McCullough, do you have anything you want to share with us before we sure. sign off today? You can always go to my website, petermcculloughmd.com. It gives you a link to all my my social media. I've just started a sub stack. It's very exciting. Uh, I'm working with best-selling author, John Leak. It'll be the only sub stack in this space that has a best-selling author, really a pro. He does this, you know, for his living, uh, being a contributor and it, it's, it's taking off uh, wildly. I think it's going to be better uh, because we can more thoroughly write the articles and cite them and give the references I'm very meticulous. You know, on Twitter, you're really limited in terms of the word count. So it's hard to really nail down the citations, but it's only by being true to the science. It's only by being objective, just presenting scientific data and then actually encouraging scientific discourse. The title of our Substack is Courageous Discourse. It's only through this process of courageous discourse will this crisis be resolved. It's not going to be resolved uh, with more uh, campaigns and advancement of a false narrative. It's not going to be advanced by techniques, propaganda techniques that claim misinformation. It's not going to be advanced that way. That's out of the old Nazi playbook, uh, uh, California, the U.S. government. You know, I hear other states are trying to do the same thing. This needs to be dropped immediately. At some point in time, the will of the nation will prevail. There's only a one-way street here. The one-way street is that people come out of this fog and they become aligned with health freedom. And, and, and that's a one-way movement. And those joining the side of health freedom grow every day. Thanks so much for having me on the program. Yeah, thank you so much. That is the end of today's episode. Our theme music is created by Andrew Bowden and production services are by Kevin Kennedy Spain of Disc of Light Media. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great week.